Right, well, welcome. Thanks everyone for being here today. It's the Professional Practices Alliance webinar on ESG, um, particularly looking at what matters for law firms in the current environment. So to introduce the, the speakers, firstly, I'm chairing the discussion today. I'm Andrew Pavlovich, partner at CM Murray, and I specialize in professional discipline and regulatory matters. Alongside me, we have Rob Millard, Cambridge Strategy Group. Rob provides strategic advice to law firms and other professional services firms on a range of matters, including ESG. Zulon Begum, who's his partner at CM Murray as well, and specializing in non-contentious partnership work. Zulon is also on the law firm, IBA Law Firm Management Committee and on the ESG subcommittee. And finally, Sarah Chilton, a senior partner at CM Murray, and she provides um, a partnership and employment advice to, to professional services firms and contentious matters. So why are we here? Well, I'm sure everyone has been to their fair share of discussions about ESG. Some of you might have even spoken on panels like this. Um, so we're not intending to sort of rewrite the wheel and go, go all the way back to basics. Um, what we're intending to do is look at the sort of the more recent shift and, and where the, the sort of the direction of travel, as it were, in terms of ESG. So I think most firms have, are com comfortable with the idea of responsible business reporting, thinking about ways they can reduce their internal emissions. But we're now seeing this shift towards a focus on advised emissions and firms being required to consider for a range of reasons, be it um, reputational risk or regulatory, potential regulatory action, the environmental impact of their client work. And we had the Law Society guidance in April of this year on climate change. And that talks about a, a range of things, one of them being the circumstances in which firms may wish to, to reject instructions from clients if the instructions weren't consistent with their firm's ESG strategy or, or their, their wider environmental philosophies. So we're going to be looking at those issues broadly today, the sort of risks that presents from an employment perspective, from an a partnership perspective, and also how firms can get their ESG strategy right in this, in this changing environment. So to kick us off, uh, Rob, you're going to introduce this concept of materiality, what that means, how firms can work out what's material for them, what they need to focus on, and what's achievable. Yes, uh, thank you, Andrew. But, but before I go on to that, though, I just want to point out that there are kind of three terms that get bandied around in, in, in this field. ESG is indeed one of them, sustainability is another, triple bottom lines another, and they all mean slightly different things. So I, I think we should be clear about what we're talking about here. I mean, ESG is primarily in the investment industry. It's talking about risks, environmental, social and governance risks uh, that, that, that affect the value of, a, of an asset. Uh, so that's one. Sustainability is about strategy. It's about doing business today in such a way that you can still thrive as a business in the future. And, and uh, so that's a somewhat different but overlapping thing. And then the third is uh, triple bottom line, which is a little bit out of fashion now, but it's uh, that's around corporate social responsibility. That's uh, take, uh, setting objectives for the business that are environmental and in, uh, economic and social. So what we're talking about today is is really all three because um this concept of materiality applies to all of them if we're talking about iso 14001 the the term is significant aspects those aspects of the business that can have a significant impact on on the environment or on on stakeholders or that can affect the business uh in in incoming as well and materiality is the term which is, is is gaining more and more traction, and it's what it means. It's what it says on the can. It's what is material, what is important, because obviously one only wants to set objectives uh, and manage, in, invest in managing, spend money on managing those things that are important. If we're talking about greenhouse gas emissions, this rather useful diagram from the world in data, our world in data shows the breakdown of greenhouse gas emissions by industry sector. And we've got en en energy being uh, unsurprisingly the lion's share and then agriculture uh, and then industry generally and waste. So which of these are relevant to us as professional service firms generally and as law firms specifically? Well, road transport, aviation, I guess a bit of rail, uh, commercial energy use. We all um, occupy offices that consume electricity. We send some waste to landfill and there's some some water. 
So that that's in total across all industry sectors. How much are we responsible for? Well, a tiny, tiny amount. So um, I think what this is saying is that it's all very well to maintain one, uh, to to manage one's internal emissions, and I'm not saying we shouldn't. We should, but it's not the whole picture. It's not the the most important impact. It's not the most material impact that professional firms and specifically law firms can have. Um, that is indeed advised emissions. In other words, the impact of our advice on what clients do. So I, I quite like this way of thinking about um, materiality. If you're below the dotted line, the things that firms have to do, we have to comply with the law. We also voluntarily submit to uh, legal requirements contractually. Uh, they, they may be with clients, they may be with uh, by virtue of, of organizations that we accept membership of, that have got uh, codes of conduct. Uh, and it's quite important to, uh, in the first instance, determine all the, 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 uh, the requirements that apply to the firm, uh, contractually or statutorily or regulatorily. Once you've done that, then you move above the dotted line. And you start asking yourself questions like um, what 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 requirements are imposed by what the strategy that we're trying to achieve the mix of our clients and uh, and which markets we want to to operate in and which services we want to provide. And then, if we go a level higher, it's what do our stakeholders um, um, expect of us? And, and Zulon is going to talk about what a stakeholder is, so I won't go any further than that. But only right at the top of the pyramid is there, well, we want to do this just because it's the right thing to do. Our stakeholders don't really require it. It's not required by law. It's not contractually required. It's actually neutral to our strategy, but we want to do it anyway. So starting at the bottom, there the have to do's. And then as we get higher, there's the should do's to the uh, would be good to do. I've got two more slides I want to show you, which which relate to the um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions re reporting requirements in the UK. The government has got a rather good website. This basically allows you to convert your units of electricity use into um, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, carbon dioxide equivalents, and they provide a, a, a conversion factor, uh, the government does. Uh, that way around, electricity to carbon dioxide equivalents, not the other way around, as was published in a, a league table that somebody published in the media a few weeks ago, where they talked about, uh, they, they produced a league table of law firms uh, where with emissions per partner expressed as kilowatt hours. I mean, that's simply wrong. That shows a, a lack of understanding of, of the most basic concept here. We're talking about taking electricity and fuel consumed in, in air miles and things like that, and translating that into how much Greenhouse gas emission does the firm produce every year. And if you're of a certain size, you have to report this to Companies House. So this is quite quite an important website. In terms of air miles, well, a similar thing. Uh, they pro provide a helpful uh, conversion factor there. And there are pieces of software that are floating around the, the market which, which automate this. Or you could just use a spread, an Excel spreadsheet if your, your accounts people are on top of it. But it's relatively simple to do this. That this this is where it, it becomes material if you have to report it. <clears throat> it's also material if your stakeholders require it, if your if your uh, if your staff or your clients um, expect you to be to to be on top of this, then it becomes important whether it's material in an objective ecological sense or not. Thanks very much. Yes, yeah, so as as you know, as, as um, Rob mentioned there identifying who your firm stakeholders are is a crucial part of any ESG strategy. How do firms go about doing that? Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Andrew. I've been on the ESG um, working group and subcommittee at the IBA for a couple of years now, so I've had quite a bit of insight as to what firms around the world are doing in terms of ESG. But the sense I've had over the last couple of years that up until quite recently, law firms have had a tendency of approaching ESG through a, either a compliance or client lens, rather than looking at it much more holistically um, as part of their kind of organizational values and business strategy. So, but I think that's moving now. So firms are now looking at it um, on a much wider viewpoint. Um, and in order to kind of develop that sustainable ESG strategy within the firm, one of the first points of call is actually to understand who your potential stakeholders are in terms of 
your su sustainability impacts. Um, and of course, for the first starting point in, in any kind of professional practice business, which especially if you're a partnership or LLP, is actually your own partners are probably the key key stakeholders in the business. And normally, you kind of um, look at in uh, look at the stakeholders in concentric circles. So with the partners in being at the centre, and often clients are view, viewed as being the most um, sort of the second most important stakeholders after that, um, as well as uh, groups like obviously your staff and associates will be very important in that um, and maybe even your local community and the wider public at large so understanding who your stakeholders are first of all and identifying them and then actually gathering data as to what's really important to those particular stakeholders there may be overlapping interests between some of those stakeholders so there may be sustainability goals that clients are pushing for that also your people your staff are also pushing for so there may be overlaps there but but at the same time there may be different goals that you know your, your staff might want they might be focused on things like workplace environment and work um work-life balance for example um whereas clients might be more um inclined towards looking at what your dni statistics might be or what your carbon emissions might be so understanding what those, what what each of those stakeholder groups actually want from the firm um, and expect from the firm is absolutely crucial. Uh, and as I said, the starting point is normally your own partnership. And in it, if you're going to build a sustainable ESG strategy, you need to have the partners behind it. Um, so building it into your um, overall business strategy as to what you'd like to do in terms of creating that sustainable business model is, is quite key and getting your partners behind it is really important. And Sarah, when you're designing or coming up with your strategy, to what extent should you be looking at sort of external factors such as the media or government even? I mean, I, there's been some criticism of lawyers recently, the campaign group, uh, lawyers are responsible, for example, was standing outside a &O's offices yes. last month, handing out leaflets, talking about the environmental impact of their work. You know, and we've recently, Wimbledon has just finished, I know it's not a law firm, but they, they were sponsored by Barclays, and there were big headlines in The Guardian, among other newspapers, talking about um, that association and celebrities coming out and saying, Wimbledon were effectively wrong to have gone with Barclays. I think the, the, the precise phrase they use were Barclays are profiting from climate chaos. Mm -hmm. So you can see how you know this is becoming a big reputational issue for firms. Is that something they should be taking into, into account in their devising strategy, or should it be clients, internal, you know, where, where does that sit? I think there's probably three aspects that firms would need to look at in terms of, you know, what what do they let drive that strategy in terms of where they want to stand on these issues? Um, and I think one valid one is the PR and reputation risk. I mean, you wouldn't um, discount it if you were looking at another issue, for example, you know, whether you were going to take on a particularly high profile client who had potentially been accused of particularly egregious behaviour. You would contemplate whether or not that was the right thing for the business on a number of levels, whether that was a, a PR risk, whether that affected the reputation of the business, whether it stood with the business's values. And so there's no reason for firms not to take that into account here. I think the other thing that firms need to be considering when they're trying to adopt their strategy and work out where they're going to draw lines, if they're going to draw lines about a certain type of clients, for example, is in relation to recruitment and retention of staff. So um, as with any issues that we see um, coming through, I mean, people will vote with their feet in terms of if they are not, if they do not feel as an associate or as a paralegal or as a member of support staff, that they are aligned with the work that the business is doing, then they will try and find somewhere where they are more aligned and they will leave. And so the risk to some businesses of losing valuable and uh, talented and skills employees is obviously a real one. And also then, you know, people might not want to come to you, but people might then also decide to leave if they are not happy with the work that's being done um, from uh, an ESG perspective. And then I think that there is that other one of the 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 reputational issue, not just in the wider world, but in terms of then what your prospective clients are going to think of you. Um, and obviously that dri drives straight into winning work from clients. And, you know, there will obviously be conflicts between certain client pools um, that any firm is going to try and target for work. But that's also a valid consideration for firms to take account of, you know, what is that going to do to potentially trying to get different types of work? Or is it going to potentially impact the reputation of a different um, 
pool of clients, for example. So all of these things are things that firms are going to have to consider really strongly. I think um, there's another issue for firms to consider in terms of the sort of wider reputation is that if you are a global firm, then obviously that will play out differently in different markets. So that's a really valid thing that firms are going to need to sit and think about. Whether they have different strategies um, you know, within different markets or, or different policies within different markets, or whether they have a global policy um, that works as best as it can for all. Um, but obviously the PR um, backlash on certain things will, will be different depending on where you are in the world. Yeah, that's a really good point. And that sort of takes us neatly to the law side to design guidance in a way and this idea about the firms taking ESG considerations into account when considering things like client acceptance. So, I mean, Rob, just to start with you, and do you think it is reasonable for, to associate firms with the activities of their clients in this way? And, and should firms be incorporating wider ethical considerations into their decision-making and acting for clients? I mean, you also involved the IBA and they've got this ethical gatekeepers project going on at the moment. And it sort of ties into that as well as specific ESG considerations. Yes, Andrew, it does. And, and whether it's reasonable or not is not really the question. It's whether society does and, and society very definitely does. Of course, they, they associate um, law firms with, with not only the clients that they have, but the kind of advice they get, they render to those clients. And to my, to my mind, it's actually the second question that's more important. I mean, all, all the, the petrochemical companies and, and many others are on their own journeys, too. They, they're trying to uh, adapt to these uh, these new pressures. Uh, well, they, they're not actually new pressures, but it, it's... A, a new realization of the magnitude of the pressures. I mean, we probably all, everybody on the on the call is aware of the uh, the IPCC, the uh, internet, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change projections of uh, a sea level rise probably between twenty and eighty centimeters by um, the end of the century. Well, there there are some experts, oceanographers, that that believe that's way understated, and we should m be thinking in terms of. Uh, more like three meters uh, sea level rise by the end of the century for the simple reason that the IPCC reports understate, uh, for very good reason, understate the impact of Antarctica uh, melting at the rate that it now is, and perhaps hitting 80 centimeters by, by 20 years time. Um, this is not beyond the realm of reason. And, and, and if that happens, and we're looking at uh, uh, existential threats to New York, to Miami, to London, to the whole of Northwest Europe, to the, the Nile Delta, Bangladesh, uh, Shanghai, the Pearl River Delta in, in, in China. And if we see that kind of impact beginning to manifest, um, then I, I think society's uh, view is going to change very quickly. Uh, and and um, the, this conversation we're having today will become moot. Yeah, thanks. I mean, that's really helpful to, to put it into perspective in that way because we're, we're sort of talking quite esoterically about these sort of issues, but there, there are some real real life consequences, some of which we, we might be seeing um, when we look at, for example, what's going on, the temperatures in, in Europe at the moment. And zoom on, um, in practice, are firms now doing this? Are you aware of firms considering sort of DSG credentials of their clients before deciding whether or not to instru accept instructions? Well, well, I, I, I think it's probably obvious, but the, the sense I get from talking to a lot of firms, um, whether clients or through my role at the IBA, is, is that it's probably the most knotty issue on the ESG debate for law firms, understandably, because there are so many regulatory issues um, involved, financial considerations, as well as like, access to justice kind of issues as well. No firm wants to turn away clients that are willing to pay the bills unless they have to for regulatory reasons because they're sanctioned or they don't meet, meet the KYC um, you know, requirements, for example. Um, but I, uh, what I don't see is people, firms really having blanket policies against, against certain types of clients because that tends to be quite a blunt instrument. You know, there, there may be bad clients out there by bad, bad I mean, inverted comma, um, um, commas, um, high polluting, oil producing companies, for example, but you could do good work for those types of clients, like, like helping them to transition to net zero. So how, where do you draw the line? Um, it, it becomes very difficult for firms. But I, I, I think what firms tend to do is have, have a, you know, some parameters around what, uh, 
it, where they might draw that line. So whether there are some good business, business reasons as to why they might want to turn down certain clients and certain mandates, whether it's, um, you know, clearly uh, you know, contrary to their sustainability goals and whether it might actually have an adverse impact on other clients who might change their perception of the firm because they're acting for certain other, you know, certain bad clients <laughs> in inverted comments. Um, and the same with staff, perception amongst the staff and whether that might drive people to leave the firm, for example, as Sarah mentioned. And also the wider market and press considerations, um, whether it might, it might generate adverse PR, in which case it will have an adverse business impact on the firm. Um, so I, so what, what I tend to see is firms taking that more nuanced approach. So having some parameters about what they might consider um, as part of their onboarding process for the client. Uh, and maybe having rather than you know um, uh, deciding by policy, but by actually deciding by committee. So a lot of firms will have um, committees like a conflicts committee who may decide whether or not to take uh, a client based on conflicts issues. Uh, and similarly, you might have a similar type of committee deciding whether uh, a new client or a new piece of work is actually um, in the best interest of the firm as a whole and its stakeholders. Um, uh, in considering all the various factors that the firm uh, has placed most importance on as part of its overall ESG strategy. And that tends to kind of work quite well, I think, because it gives firms some discretion and it's much more a new, much more nuanced approach than having any kind of blanket policy against certain types of clients. Yeah, that's very really interesting. I, I went to a Law Society Gazette Roundtable recently and it was a sponsored by a firm that do due diligence and they, they provide not only the the sanctions checks and the AML checks to the cap to can we act, but they also look for adverse media. And if it's a firm that has reporting obligations for ESG, they set all of that out. So, so there's a sort of two strands to it. The first is can we act? The second is should we act? And they, they, they say they're there to try and help firms make that sort of second decision. Sarah, um, you know, so if we are going to potentially turn certain clients away because of the, the work that the um, that they're asking us to do. Does that present any risks from a partnership or an employment perspective? You know, disgruntled partners, for example. Um, yeah, I think I think it potentially does. So I think maybe just to go back one moment. I'm sorry if I'm going off script, but just to, to another way of looking at that sort of risk assessment that someone um helpfully sort of was chatting to me about is to look at it sort of threefold. So it's a little bit like what Zulon was saying, but you know, um, analysing the severity of the impact of what the client's about to do, the likelihood of that impact happening, and then, in fact, your ability to influence it, which I think is what Zulam's also speaking about. And I think the other point that often we don't talk about is is not just we talk about the kind of clients, like, as Zulam was trying to call them, the bad, the bad, I can't even remember the bad clients, but or the not good clients. Um, but there's also that question of institutional investment and and where we stand on that. And I think if you are going to start uh, doing value judgments on clients that you will and won't accept and I think you, you kind of in a way have to cast that net, net a bit wider and think about the impact of other types of clients on the environment because it isn't just those frontline fossil fuel producing clients necessarily who are going to have that significant impact they're obviously funded and that goes back to the point you made about Wimbledon like that's the objection to Barclays about the funding of the fossil fuels and so you know are we going to see people starting to take um, stances against banks, against institutional investors, against funds, et cetera. So, um, you know, I, I just mentioned that because I was thinking about it as Dylan was speaking, but it's a, it's a really wide issue as to making these decisions and deciding who you will and won't act for. As to the point about what impact it has, yeah, I totally see that internally that could cause problems. So there is one legal issue, and then I think there's a lot of other um, more nuanced um, HR and people management issues. The legal issue is that a belief in climate change is a potentially protectable belief under the Equality Act. So there was case law dating back um, some time now um, where uh, somebody had a belief in climate change and they brought a claim and it was upheld as being potentially protectable under the religion and belief legislation under the Equality Act. And what that means is that um, potentially if, if that was to be found in each of these cases is assessed on its own merits and each person's belief is assessed on its own merits, but if someone, for example, had a belief in climate change um, and the impact of climate change on the world, um, they may potentially have that protection. So if they were harassed on that basis or if they were treated less favorably because of that belief 
or if there was a policy that they were um, inadvertently disadvantaged by, they may have a claim against the business. And so there, there is that potential for either which way you look at it, because that belief legislation protects those who have the belief, but also protects a lack of belief or an opposing belief. There are tests to whether or not a belief can be protected. Um, and one of those tests relates to the cogency of that belief. And so there would be a question, I think, um, as to you know, whether or not certain extreme beliefs are cogent. And those beliefs also have to be worthy of respect in a democratic society. And we've seen a lot of debate recently about certain beliefs and whether they are or aren't worthy of respect. But you can definitely see a world in which competing beliefs about climate change and its impact on the world potentially could become protectable and, and may not align with one another. So I think where firms start declining work um, and, uh, and people get angry about it, I don't think it's the declining of the work that necessarily causes legal issues for the, for the firm within the partnership, but it's the reaction and the potential comments that are made to people and the arguments that might ensue in a meeting that where people might um, stray into the territory of um, treating someone less favorably or harassing them on the grounds of, of a belief that they hold. I mean, I think that there's a wider, a slight wider issue, which I think we'll come on to, which is what happens if you have employees refusing to do the work. But I think we'll, we'll come on to that in a moment. Uh, I think the other issue is that firms will inevitably, if they are turning work away, they will have to replace that work or they are going to run into other more traditional difficulties of how are they going to pay their employees and, and how are they going to deal with dropping partner profit share? And I think, you know, that's in a way from a more cultural perspective, firms need to have people on board with that because what you don't want in a firm is for certain people to think you should have taken the work, certain people to have decided not to take the work. That has an impact on the bottom line. And then there's more infighting about how that should be distributed and who should get a share of what in the profits. Um, and so, I mean, we're now into more sort of traditional partner dispute, partnership dispute territory, but that's a real risk, I suppose. And so trying to get everyone on board from the start is obviously the key to trying to avoid these things. It's not always going to be that straightforward, though. Yeah, I think that, that goes back to the point that Zunon was making about you know, the partners being really one of the first ports of call as the stakeholders and, and working out the strategy, because if, if you are going to have people taking different views when work is turned down like that, it's going to potentially be a recipe for, yeah. for disaster. So just yeah. to say one thing, I think the remuneration systems are also going to be relevant. So how you reward people, because what that does is incentivize it's in certain systems, partners just take on clients so that they have you know, excellent partner billings. Um, and I think, you know, thinking about rewarding people in a different way or encouraging uh, behaviours that you want to encourage by way of remuneration systems and maybe moving away from that model slightly will help impact behaviour. Whereas I think if you have a pure, um, if you win a client, you get paid more, then there's a, an additional incentive to take on that work that may not be the, the kind of work that the firm wants to be doing. And I have a problem with like both advice and remuneration. I mean, it's that should firms be baking that into their remuneration systems, commitments to, and we've talked about that environment, environmental considerations, but pro bono commitments to pro bono work, for example, or promoting diversity in the workforce, are these all things that should be part of a remuneration process to encourage the right behaviours within firms? Well, I'm increasingly seeing those types of elements of behavioural requirements um, seeping into the whole partner assessment and remuneration, remuneration policies. Um, uh, and again, I, I think you always have to start with your strategy in the first place. What is your strategy? And then that obviously filters out to what your remuneration policies are, what your assessment policies are um inevitably and of course how you kind of manage that also depends on what remuneration system you have in place whether it's you know it's quite rare now whether it's you know, pure luck step it's maybe a, a little bit harder to change behaviors in those types of um systems because you know uh partner profits are so par partner remuneration is dependent on how long you're at, you're at the firm but if you have a more of a um, merit-based system or some kind of balanced scorecard it's quite much more easier to incorporate certain types of behaviors and expectations around ESG that you might want you might want to encourage in your partners so um, classic examples are around um, how you promote um, diversity and inclusion within your team and um, whether you're bringing in whether your team is diverse whether you're promoting people in your team who have diverse characteristics, 
um, as well as things like um, uh, it, it generally uh, commitment to things like the firm's, uh, firm's strategy around pro bono and dedicating a certain number of hours, whether as individually as a partner, as, as a wider team, um, to pro, pro bono and CSR initiatives that the firm is espousing. Um, I'm also seeing other kind of policies around, generally policies, not just around remuneration, but also um, firm-wide policies on um, recruitment and promotion, for example, which bakes in, um, you know, I see policies where uh, the firm will only go to recruiters who put forward balance, uh, more balanced and diverse slate of candidates for any, any kind of lateral hiring um, in order to improve the firm's diversity. Uh, and similarly, using those kind of criteria and its promotion criteria as well as to whether a certain number of people are put forward for promotion every year um, that have those diverse um, characteristics. Uh, and other policies around travel, so that those are kind of classic examples. And it's, it's been a bit easier post-COVID, actually, to change your travel policy is to put much more scrutiny, scrutiny on business travel, whether partners partners and employees actually have to fly to meetings or whether it can be done with Zoom by Zoom. Um, there's one firm that I saw, a, a regional firm, who changed their policies actually even before COVID. Um, there was a tendency of, of partners to fly to other regional offices and they just refused to pay for those um, um, flights anymore. So far, partners are either forced to take the train or, or drive. Um, so it's, it's those kind of small incremental changes that can show your commitment to ESG and hopefully make a change in the long term to towards a more sustainable business. OK, so we've gone a bit down the track. So we've, we've worked out how our stakeholders are, we've devised our strategy and we've got the strategy in place. And what happens then if a partner goes rogue? You know, if you have a partner goes on social media saying climate change is a hoax and the world is flat, etc. Whatever you know, is there a mechanism for firms to, for firms to deal with partners that behave in that way? Um, how should part, how should firms go around rewarding? We talked about rewarding the right behaviours, but how how about dealing? How do they deal with the, the wrong behaviours? And I suppose my starting point would be whatever behaviours you want to encourage or discourage, you will need to set them out in advance so that people know what's expected of them and bake them into your policies and then link those into your LLP agreement and the powers that you might have. So, um, you know, if someone goes rogue and that damages the reputation of the business, for example, then that is, you know, potentially going to be a breach of, in your example, the social media policy. Um, potentially that feeds into a breach of the partner's fiduciary duties to act in the best interest of the firm. Um, and then potentially that can lead to some sort of sanction in certain circumstances. And I think my moderating uh, comment on that would be just to make sure that they are not expressing a protected belief um, and that, you know, it's not the belief that is making you take that adverse action against them. And there's some complicated things to weigh up there. Um, uh, there's the distinction between the belief itself being the reason for the treatment, the manifestation of the belief being the reason for the treatment, because, you know, someone might hold a protectable belief, but manifest it in a grossly uh, awful way that bullies and harasses people and that's you know a, a different question um but you know if you can satisfy yourself that you are not discriminating against someone or treating them unfavorably or harassing them because of a, a protected belief that they may hold then you would be able to take action against a partner that would go rogue i think employees are a slightly different and more complicated category because the difference being that a partner has got a higher level of obligation to the firm to protect the firm and to act in the best interest of the firm under their fiduciary obligations. Most employees don't have, and uh, employees obviously have also greater rights in the sense of unfair dismissal rights and constructive dismissal rights. So I think it's probably easier for a firm to take action against a partner in, in this context. Um, but again, as I say, it's much easier if you bake that in at the beginning so that you have the grounds to um, point to something that they have they have breached or they have gone against which will make it easier for you to take action. Yeah, and, and Rob, I gave a very sort of crude example there, but but what if you had a part a, a genuine disagreement between partners and the partner went on and didn't say about climate change being a hoax, but talked, for example, about access to justice, you know, or, or something like that, and there was a new, more nuanced discussion. Could you, can you see, a, 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 you know, we've spoken about the need to get all the partners on board, but is this a real, is there a real divide between partners and the way they view these sorts of issues and whether 
solicitors should be just doing the work that they're instructed to do or whether they should have these wider view take these wider societal views into account so i i think you know you know partners uh, and other other people in the firm may have philosophical issues with acting for certain clients but not others um and that's a valid debate and it's probably more difficult for the firm to to deal with because there is no right or wrong answer on this um but where you see more co common kind of disgruntlement, especially among partners, rather than, you know, not necessarily the types of partners who are you know, philosophically completely opposed to it and might think they're, think they're flat earthers, but they may simply just be disgruntled because um, they see their opportunities narrowing because of the firm's ESG sustainability policies. So whereas they may have acted for clients previously, done certain types of work previously, those our channels may dry up as a result of the firm's strategy on ESG. So the firm really, uh, going back to, again, the, the key stakeholders of the business being partners, uh, alongside its ESG strategy, has to have a strategy as to how it will replace that type of work and how it can transition the partners who were dedicated to, to certain types of work that maybe the firm wants to move away from, how they can, those partners and, and the staff as, uh, and teams associated with that type of work can be transition to different types of work that the firm is uh, is more in keeping with the firm's sustainability goals. And again, recognizing that in the um, firm's remuneration policies, that at least in the transitional period is, is important. So, um, you know, if a partner is for the last 10 years has acted for fossil fuel on, on drilling in Antarctica, then the remuneration policy has to recognise that there will be a period of transition for, for that particular partner to move to other types of work. Um, and having that kind of multi-pronged strategy, so alongside your sustainability strategy, having a strategy as to how you kind of deal with that transition within your remuneration policies, will hopefully um, deal with some of that disgruntlement um, and help partners uh, kind of align with the firm's um, firm's goals around sustainability um, as a whole rather than create discontent and um, rogue partners who may go off and um, you know go on a Twitter crusade against the firm. Yeah can, can I just add to that I mean I mean we focused a lot about which client shouldn't we advise and and uh, and, and the threat side if you like but there, there's a massive opportunity side here uh, to to this as well and it's not just uh, should we be advising firms uh, clients on ESG. I mean, th this permeates every aspect of a client business. And, and Barclays is a firm that's been named. Uh, and so uh, financial big banks, definitely, but not just banks. Uh, it, it's really across all industry sectors. So uh, if, if you're advising firms on capital markets and speaks to debt, I mean, uh, sustainable debt is becoming uh, just about all debt is becoming sustainable debt. Uh, on the equity side, uh, the, the, the ESG considerations in due diligence. Uh, well, that, um, sorry, uh, that, that's on the M&A side, but on, on, on the equity side, all the all the bosses have got regulations now that, uh, that listed companies have to comply with and reporting as well. So there are there there are a whole slew of new aspects to existing services and new services fundamentally that are emerging and and firms uh, that are forward looking are are are, take, are capitalizing on this and actually we again you you make a good point there because we've been looking at it from the from the firm's perspective but clients are also expecting firms certain have certain expectations on firms now as well they're, they're increasingly asking firms to demonstrate their own ESG credentials and if they have panels of firms that they want to work with they'll have criteria etc so there's there's a we can't just look at it from one perspective i guess so we were talking about this sort of disgruntled partner but what about and we touched on this already um the, if you have a group of perhaps younger associates or trainees who have strong beliefs and say actually we don't want to act for these sort of clients or i don't want to act on this for this client or on this matter um, would the firm have to respect that? And what's your view, Sarah? So I think potentially yes, if those beliefs meet the the test and the threshold for being a philosophical belief. And I think, um, although there was a bit of commentary around the time of the case that I mentioned um, some years ago that um, you know the legislation wasn't intended. I think the government came out at the same time and said the legislation wasn't intended to protect that type of belief. 
um, I think potentially now everyone will take maybe a different view and have more sympathy with that belief being protected. Um, partly because case law has shown us that other um, beliefs similar in nature, although very difficult, di different in terms of the actual belief, are protected. But also just because the world has moved on a lot and maybe a belief in climate change and that it was going to signal catastrophic um, problems for hu huge parts of the world, which was the belief of the um, person in that particular case. I think a lot of people might have thought that that was extreme, whereas no one, I think, well, not no, you know, you know the majority think that's not that extreme anymore. And we have also had the, sadly, the benefit of a decade of actually seeing the impact that it's had. So I think firms would be wise to assume that that belief is protected. So then there's the question of, well, um, what legal risks does that pose for a firm? So there was a case um, some years ago of a um, celebrant who was Christian, who was, um, did a job which the normal job required her to marry same-sex couples, and she refused to do so. And then so the court had to consider whether or not um, the, the employer had to turn favourably by trying to make her do that. And um, the... The policy was a policy applying to everyone. So this is because of indirect discrimination. So they had the ability to justify their decision. Um, and the uh, so, so I think we look at that sort of case law. Um, and in, in that case, they um, said that they were justified in expecting everyone to be able to treat everybody in a non-discriminatory manner. Um, so that's the sort of most obvious um, case I can think of. But actually, I think this is more difficult because actually, what we'd be saying is we expect all our associates to um, act for, say, let's say, fossil fuel companies. And the question then is, well, that's not saying we expect you all to act in a non-discriminating manner. So we're not asking them to do something great and good and to not break the law in respect of other people. We're effectively asking them to uh, help us make money. And so I think we don't have that um, kind of uh, flip side, as it were. So I think then the question is, well, by, by what would happen? Would we be talking about, well, are we discriminating against them by punishing them for, for refusing to do that work? So normally, if we said to someone, we want you to do this kind of work, and they went, well, I'm not doing it because I don't want to, we would potentially have a, a remedy. So we might want to performance manage that person. We might want to give them some sort of warning. We might want to um, you know, talk to them about you know, their, their duties to the business, et cetera. So the question would be, is that action against that person discriminatory on the, of the, on the grounds of their belief? And it's pretty untested territory, I think. Um, I mean, I think possibly that the individuals could refuse to do the work and but potentially be protected in that regard. Um, but I think we'd have to wait and see, but it's certainly a risk. And I think firms would just need to look at every case on its individual facts and whether or not there was a potential direct discrimination against that particular individual or whether or not it was a policy that applied to everyone and therefore it was indirect discrimination. Indirect discrimination can be justified if it's a proportionate means of achieving legitimate aim. And I think the question would be, you know, would that request to do that kind of work be a justifiable request? I'm not sure um, uh, if it would. The, the legitimate aim can't just be about money. Um, so um, potentially it, it wouldn't be justified. Um, but, it, you know, it would go to the cohesion of the associate pool. Everyone take an equal share of the work, etc. So you could see circumstances in which that may be considered legitimate. So I think it's a difficult issue for firms if, if that does start to happen. Um, and one that they will have to tread through quite carefully. And I'm sure we will see some cases coming out where we test that climate change belief again and then test all those other issues associated with it. No, that's really interesting. I, I um, went to an event recently where one, a managing partner of a firm said he had received a letter from the firm's trainees saying they weren't willing to act for, for certain clients, um, which I thought was quite interesting that you know, trainees are sort of sent, sending this to managing partners. I think it shows a little bit of the generational shift perhaps um, and that would cause an interesting issue because obviously that's that's a group of in, a whole cohort of people signing a letter saying they're not wanting to do, do certain types of work. There's another legal issue which is around whistleblowing so if the individual or group of people thought that the business was doing something that potentially breached a legal obligation um, they might bring a concern about that and they may end up protected by the whistleblowing legislation so protection from retaliation for having raised that concern. Um, and I think that's possibly less likely to happen in a law firm, more likely to happen um, in a client. Um, but you could have situations, for example, where people are seconded out to clients who, who operate in fossil fuel energy fields and raise concerns about the conduct of that client. And that could bring whistleblowing issues that firms need to engage with. Mm.
Finally, I wanted to touch on, on regulation because the Law Society guidance um, has talks about the duty on solicitors to uphold public trust and confidence in the profession and to act with integrity. And it says that, and it says the SRA could take action against individuals that uh, whistle, you know, act for clients that are trying or attempting to greenwash or even against individuals that greenwash their own firm's uh, credentials. So there's potential for action there, but more widely, what role do you think regulators have here? I mean, do you think it's realistic in the future? Do you think firms of a certain size or a turnover could be required to annually report on emissions? Do you think we'll get to that sort of stage as we have in, in other sectors or of, of other industries? Well, we are already there in terms of firms having to report on their emissions in the, in the UK at any rate. Um, I, I think that, that lawyers need to be careful about becoming legislators uh, and uh, regulators need to as well. They're, they're, uh, the, the proper way for this to be dealt with is through, uh, through legislation, uh, through the, the due democratic process. The trouble with that is that there's often a lag uh, and, and uh, when that lag becomes really apparent that there's a gap between what the legislation requires and, uh, and what action is required on the, bar, on the part of firms, uh, then, then the the safest way to deal with it is to flip back to stakeholders and and stakeholders. I mean, when you get down to brass tacks, stakeholders are anybody who can affect the firm's success or who are affected by the firm. And and um, if we look at it particularly from the former bit, that would include clients, it would include partners, it would include um, uh, employees. So what do they think? Particularly clients, because they are under far, a far heavier whip than we are. So uh, candid discussions with clients about what do you expect of us? How can we help you with your journey? And uh, what new services can we introduce? How can we be more helpful to you? Those are very rich, typically very rich conversations. And, and, and they, they, they uh, bring up both opportunities and challenges. Uh, and, and so that is the way that I, I would recommend firms take it forward. I would add, um, Andrew, that... Uh... The EU CSRD is due to come into effect early next year, mm -hmm. uh, and that's going to apply to certainly European headquartered law firms of a certain size, and possibly also UK headquartered law firms that have a certain um, size presence within the EU member states. Um, so if you think of some of the big international firms, it is likely to apply to them. Uh, and the EU CSRD goes much further than just emissions um, reporting. It, it requires reporting on a range of um, ESG metrics. It's currently undergoing consultation, but it's due to come into effect next year, and, as I said, 1st of January next year. And that will be quite a sea change, I think, for law firms and other professional practices on the types of issues that they will need to report on um, and will probably create, a, create a, a, an impetus from a regulatory point of view um, but maybe also in a good way uh, with firms looking at the whole sustainability strategy in, in a much more holistic way, as I mentioned right at the outset, um, because they do have these regulatory obligations to report on these issues. And what about the SRA taking the lead from the Law Society and talking and issuing their own guidance on things like client selection? You know, should should that be a regulatory issue or is it ultimately an issue for firms to, to make their own decisions and take their own decision as to you know, the level of reputational risk that they're willing to incur by acting for certain certain clients or otherwise? Sarah, can I have a go at that one? Yeah, I, I think the issue, I think, for a lot of firms is access to justice. And um, the there was, the, I think, the chair of the Bar Council has come out and expressed concern, particularly in contentious matters about um, anyone trying to interfere with the ability for firms to take on particular clients who may need representation. Um, and I mean, they did say that that's more acute in a um, contentious matter and you can see how that would play out. So if someone's been a, a business or an individual has been accused of particular criminal conduct or regulatory conduct and needs representation. Um, so I, I think it's difficult. On the one hand, I think, well, this is an opportunity for the profession as a whole to to do good and to influence something huge and significantly important for the future of the planet. And um, it's not just the planet, I, I think, um, you know, it's the human rights of the people that live in it, it's the impact that it has, particularly on um, people across the globe, 
who, who may be in areas way more affected than we are with housing and facilities that are already um, you know, not as robust to be able to withstand the, the environmental pressures. So there's a significant human rights and human life issue to this as well. So on the one hand, I think that's a great opportunity for the profession. On the other hand, I think that as soon as a regulator tries to interfere with who we can and can't act for, they are potentially interfering with the access to justice of clients, um, which I really believe is sort of a fundamental part of the rule of law. And also, as Rob says, we're not legislators. The regulator is not a legislator. You know, none of us are democratically elected, whether you sit as, um, you know, within the regulatory body or not. And, you know, in a way, if, if we're going to be making decisions that are that wide ranging on some, an issue such as access to justice, should that not be a decision left for people who have been democratically elected? Um, so I probably veer towards that view, albeit, I, you know, I sometimes think this is a great opportunity for us as a profession to, to do good, which sometimes, you know, we need to find that purpose and, and that thing that we want to, you know, make a difference as lawyers. I think we all sort of often feel like that, but I'm not sure that it's our place to do so. Yeah, that's interesting because I've heard um, a few people say access using access to justice as a get out of jail card for lawyers and an, an excuse um, to do to act for certain clients. And you can certainly see some uh, cases where you can you can imagine that people wouldn't struggle to get representation, and firms could maybe could take their own view. But then it, there's it's also a matter of principle and how far you're willing to bend that principle, or whether you think that ultimately that that is one that's worth preserving generally and for all clients i think as well there's that, that that other piece which we touched on earlier which is can you influence the the client so not all acting for a client that the population might think of as a bad client is going to be bad work and um, you know there will be the opportunity to do good work for people clients who have so far been bad clients in the eyes of the, the you know majority and i think that's an opportunity for people um in the profession um so, yeah, I and mean, I think it's very difficult to make blanket statements about kind of which clients you should and shouldn't act for and, and why. Well, we're at 9.58. We did have one question from Sarah Crowell. I think it may have been answered, actually, by, what you, by the way you spoke, what you said. But when deciding whether a, a climate change or commitment to climate change is a philosophical belief, should it be considered on a case by case basis? If so, how do you ensure fair treatment across employees? Yes, in short, it is case by case and it's case by case on whether the belief, I mean, everything, I suppose, is case by case on the treatment of an individual will be individual to that person. But it's it's individual because not everyone will hold the belief in the same way. And there's a, I suppose the way I think of it is there's sort of a requirement to live and breathe your belief. And it was played out in the veganism case, which people may or may not be aware of, because the person, um, for example, um, you know, wouldn't um, do certain things that would impact the lives of even insects, for example, and the way that he lived his life. And that helped him to establish his belief. Um, and so, yes, it's it's individual and each case will be assessed on its own merits. And so, yeah, it's it's difficult to ensure fair treatment across employees. But I suppose I would say start with very clear policies about what you expect of people, what you will and won't um, do by way of, you know, what kind of clients you will and won't act for. And that's a good starting point to try and ensure fair treatment across all. But yes, you will need to take an individualised basis to those particularly risky issues and assess the risk on an individual basis. Okay, well, that's taken us to 10 o'clock. Um, so you can see comments, lots of thanks, which is great to see. Thank you very much uh, for listening. I think it's been a really good discussion. I certainly got a lot out of it. I believe we have an in-person um, just discussion lined up for mergers uh, later in the year as well. So we will be in touch forever about, about that. But thank you very much for everyone who's listened. And as I say, we'll, we'll stay on for another couple of minutes if anyone does want to stay on and ask, ask anything further.